Well, welcome to another Friday night. We uh, had a little bit of technical trouble at the very beginning of this video, so I'm just gonna film the introduction. I'm standing here by the Detroit River, looking across at Detroit, and then we'll move inside for the, the full teaching that was recorded earlier. What I wanna talk about today is, if you're going to understand complex trauma, you really need to come to understand that the overwhelming main emotion of a person with complex trauma is fear. Now, many would say, well, I don't have fear. And that's part of what makes this so tricky is that many people who have fear and are controlled by fear are totally unaware of it. They have pushed it down so far into their subconscious that they're not even aware that it's there. And so part of what I want to do today is help you begin to explore whether fear is a main driving force in your life. So to give you a context on it, think of it in terms of a healthy child growing up in a healthy family. If they have fear, they go to their parents and that fear could be due to their in danger, they feel they're getting hurt, their needs aren't being met and they're not sure if they're gonna get met. So they go to their parents and their parents meet those needs, protect them and the problems resolve and the fear goes away. So fear is not a constant issue with them, it happens very rarely. But in complex trauma, the child has unmet needs, the child is in danger, the child gets hurt and they go to parents to get that need resolved and parents are too busy, parents have their own problems, parents are abusive to them, parents tell them to get over it. So it doesn't get resolved. And so they live now with unresolved fear. And then another fear comes along due to an unmet need or due to being hurt or in danger and they go to get that resolved and it's not resolved. So then another fear gets added to the pile and one unresolved fear after another and pretty soon what begins to happen is they realize nobody's protecting me nobody's meeting my needs consistently i'm all on my own all on my own here against this world i'm in trouble and so fear now is all the time because it's just little me against a big bad world and i don't have the resources for that and so fear takes over, but who wants to live with fear? And so they push it down to the subconscious without realizing that it's still running their life. It still gets triggered. It still does all kinds of damage when it gets triggered, but fear becomes the main emotion. Now back to the healthy family. What's the main emotion of that child where fear is resolved? The main emotion is I want to love others. I want to connect with others. I want to be authentic. I want to meet my needs and the needs of others. So there's very different driving forces in their life that are very healthy and positive. Whereas in the child from complex trauma, that force, that driving force is fear. So let's go to the main lesson now. So we want to dig into this just to help you see how big of an issue it is. So the 50th characteristic of complex trauma is anxiety issues. So PTSD, GAD, generalized anxiety disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder are all classified under anxiety disorders. And over 90% of people with complex trauma end up with anxiety and depression. And the two usually go together. So if you were to reduce a definition of anxiety or understanding anxiety, think of it through the eyes of a child. You feel anxiety when you don't have resources to handle a situation. So take that further. Anxiety or fear then is actually a gift because what happens when you don't have resources as a child to handle a scary situation? You feel fear, but what does fear make you do? It makes you run to somebody 
who's bigger than you, who's stronger than you, who can protect you. And it makes you want to connect with them. And if you connect with them and they then come in to protect you and help you with that circumstance that's too big for you, then you relax because the problem is now resolved. You've connected to somebody stronger than you that loves you. So fear is a gift that drives you to the right person for protection and so that the situation is resolved. But what happens in complex trauma? The child's in a situation that they can't handle. They're afraid they're going to get hurt. They run to mom and dad to connect, and no connection is available. Dad's too busy. Mom's got her own mental health issues. They're angry. They lash out, all kinds of different things, but they're not able to connect with the people they should be able to connect to. Therefore, they're not able to resolve the fear. The problem doesn't go away. And so the fear now is constantly there because they feel all alone to face a scary, big, bad world. They feel abandoned. And fear becomes a constant. And it now begins to control because basically if I can't connect with anybody, I better figure out how to do keeping myself safe, and so it be, fear just constantly becomes this controlling emotion for them. So let me just take you through a list of the main fears that come out of this fear, and then I'm going to give you a bunch of secondary fears, and you can check off the ones that are true of you, and what you're going to hopefully begin to see is how much fear actually plays a part in your life. And it might be a little bit scary, but hopefully eye-opening and lead to some real growth for you. Fear of getting hurt. That's the big fear. Because you see, I'm just mean. I can't connect with anybody, so I'm going to constantly be going up against things that are dangerous and bigger than me, so I could get hurt physically, emotionally, and I don't want that. So there's this constant fear in every situation of getting hurt. How do I avoid it? Next one, fear of failure. You see, in a healthy home, if a child fails, the parents nurture the child, teach the child from the failure. The failure turns into a positive growth experience. What happens in many complex trauma homes is if you fail, then you get made fun of, you get punished, you get disrespected, you get told you're stupid, people are impatient with you, people reject you. So failure is not a positive thing. Failure is a negative thing that hurts but also results in more painful things, shame, disrespect, rejection. And so for most people coming out of complex trauma, they don't ever want to fail. Because fail, failure for them, nothing good comes out of failure. So they have a great fear of failure. Then that fear of the unknown. When I go into a new situation that I've never been in before, uh oh something might be there that could hurt me. And so there's a huge fear of going into unknowns. It just triggers a whole bunch of fear. And that's why for many people, when they go into an unknown situation, <clears throat> they pester you wanting to know every little detail about what's going to happen. Because they're trying to get rid of as many unknowns as possible. That's how big their fear is. Fear of change. Every time you go through a change, you're kind of going into a new unknown. You might know some of the new territory, but you're not going to know all of the new territory because stuff has changed, so you might get hurt. 
And that's what's coming up again. Unknown, possible hurt. Change, possible hurt. Therefore, the brain says, avoid change. Avoid the unknown. That's the way to avoid hurt. But one that's very interesting for many people is fear of success. So if you've gone through a life where you were put down, nobody taught you tools, so failure was a constant part of your life, now you're learning tools, now you're beginning to grow, and you're getting successful. Your relationships are going well, your job is going well, and what happens in the brain is this is an unknown. We've never been here before. We don't know how to handle this. Something bad might happen. We could get hurt. So success, let's not celebrate it. Let's get scared is what comes out of that fear. And then for other people coming out of complex trauma, one of the worst times for them in childhood when, is when everything was quiet and going smoothly. Because for them that meant, uh-oh, the other shoe is about to drop. Something bad is about to happen. So as soon as anything is going too smoothly, uh-oh, that is a sign that something bad is about to happen. And so that leads to the next thing that characterizes people with complex trauma is they often sabotage success. They sabotage when things are going smoothly because they go, it's, something bad's going to happen anyways, so let's just get it over with and go back to failure, back to pain and chaos and drama because we know how to handle that. So those are some of the main fears. Now, I just want to stop and highlight. We've already covered some other fears. So we looked extensively at shame, and shame is basically a fear that you're going to find out who I really am because then you'll reject me. So we've looked at that. We've looked at coming out of that shame is I don't ever want to be a burden or a pain. I'm afraid of being a burden or a pain because then you're going to think I'm too much work and you'll reject me. And then also coming out of shame is I long for intimacy, but I'm afraid of intimacy because if you get to know me too well, you're going to find out I'm not much of a catch and you're going to reject me. So there's a bunch of fears we've already covered. I just want to repeat. The next one that's so important to understand is people with complex trauma want to hope, but they're afraid to hope. So the graph shows what happens for most people coming out of complex trauma. They get their hopes up that, okay, dad just rejected me. Dad didn't have time for me. I couldn't connect with dad, and I tried. I didn't get my needs met. So hopefully, if I just change, it must be my fault. So I'll do more chores. I'll be kinder to dad. I'll do extra things for dad. And then hopefully then dad will accept me and want to connect with me and meet my needs. So that's where they go in their head. So they start doing extra stuff, and it seems to be going well. Dad seems to be He's not rejecting them. He's kind of meeting their needs. So they start to get their hopes up. And then all of a sudden, something triggers dad, and it's back to disconnect, not meeting needs, rejection, hurt. Their hopes get dashed. Now, there's really two dynamics that have happened there. Number one is they got hurt, and that is very painful, but secondly, they got their hopes up and their hopes were dashed. That's really painful. That's a second pain that got added on to it. But the child has this amazing capacity to keep hoping. 
And they keep thinking, okay, it must be my fault. I got to figure out what I'm not doing right, and I got to change that. So maybe if I wear this mask, maybe if I become a hero, maybe if I become a comedian, maybe if I get involved in sports because dad likes sports. And they just keep trying one option after another. And each time they get their hopes up, maybe this is going to result in getting connection in my needs net. And it doesn't. Round 10 to 13, they finally get to a point where they go, I don't think there's any point in getting my hopes up anymore because dad is never going to meet my needs. Dad's not going to connect with me. And they lose hope. Now, what happens 20 years later? They get into recovery. They start doing well. They get a good job, relationships. And it goes, do I get my hopes up that I'm going to get a healthier, better life? Oh, boy. Every time I've got my hopes up so far in life, they've got dashed. You know what? I don't know if I want to get my hopes up again. So that, again, is where a lot of people will sabotage doing well in recovery to avoid getting their hopes up. It's easier in their mind to not have hope. It's less painful to not have hope than to get your hopes up and have them dashed. That's a powerful fear. Now the next one to me is one of the biggest ones that most people aren't aware of, and that's the fear of abandonment. So what happens in complex trauma a child wants to connect, but can't. So they feel rejected, they feel neglected, they feel alone, but they feel abandoned. Some are actually literally abandoned. They're given up to well, the, the child welfare system or for adoption. But even in homes that their physical needs are met, when their emotional needs aren't consistently met, they feel a certain amount of abandonment. What is the thing, the hurt, the wound that gives the worst, greatest pain? I think it's abandonment. Nothing says to you more loudly and more painfully that you are a zero than for people to abandon you. Basically says you're worthless. We don't want anything to do with you. It is the loudest statement of a shame message that you have zero value. It is super, super painful. And what comes out of that is this deep fear of ever being abandoned again, of a commitment to never be abandoned again. That is so loud inside of most people. Loud in the sense that it's big, but they're not, maybe not aware of it. So let me just get you to think about this a little bit further, because to me it's such an important thing to understand and to see if it applies to you. See, what happens when a person is abandoned, it alters their identity from positive to negative, from I have value to I have no value. It's the biggest shame message, and the child believes it. Usually at a subconscious level, it is the controlling core belief, I have no value. So what happens when they go into a relationship in adult life is they basically have already concluded that once these people get to know me, they're going to abandon me, just like mom and dad. That's the truth of my life. They're going to find out I have zero value. So with that core belief guiding them as they go into relationships, when they get into a relationship, they now twist and distort everything that the other person does to fit that belief that they must see I don't have value. They must think I don't have value. They must be preparing to abandon me. They think I'm stupid. They're about to reject me. All of what the other person does gets twisted to fit the core belief. So let me show you some of the things that happen. So let's say 
They're watching this person they're now building a friendship with, in a relationship with, and they see them doing all kinds of nice things to them. But they have a core abandonment, shame, belief. So what do they say in their head? Well, they twist that. They go, okay, they're acting loving to me. They don't really love me. They're just probably using me. They've got some agenda for me. They're saying lots of nice things to me, but they're probably saying lots of negative things behind my back about me. Wow, they didn't seem super excited to see me today. Yesterday, their eyes lit up when they saw me. Today's their eyes didn't light up. Uh Uh-oh, uh-oh, they're probably getting tired of me and are getting ready to get rid of me. Or they probably have so many filters in their brain when they talk to me. If they were to take those filters out, they would say all kinds of negative things to me about me and only a few positive things. But because of all of their filters, they only say positive things to me. They must filter out hundreds of negative things that they wish they could say, but they don't want to hurt my feelings. Or you see them talking to somebody else, and they're laughing and having a good time. And you go, oh, see, they're probably more interested in that person now than me. They're probably going to start spending more time with that person and less time with me, and eventually they're just going to leave me, and that's going to be their main friend. That's what's going on in the brain of a person with that fear of abandonment. But then it goes even further. They will then go, you're going to abandon me anyways, So I am going to try to drive you away. And they actually, the very thing they fear is to be abandoned, but they actually end up creating, trying to get people to abandon them. So they'll do it in one of two ways, or both. Become super, super needy, clingy, demanding, smothering, not give the person any space, always there, always wanting something, always wanting attention and validation. And the other person eventually just goes, whoa, whoa, you're way too much work. I can't take this. You don't respect my boundaries. I'm out of here. And the person goes, see, they're going to abandon me anyways. That's what everybody does. Without realizing they brought it about. Or some, they meet a really healthy person And then they meet a really unhealthy person and they will get in a relationship with an unhealthy person, but the really healthy person, they go, no, and they just cut that person out of their life because they don't feel worthy of them. They feel that once that healthy person sees them, that healthy person is not going to want anything to do with them when they see what they're really like. And so they create... Abandonment by healthy people get in relationships with unhealthy people who will eventually abandon them. And then another thing they do is they test constantly in relationships by game playing. So they might just, the person wants to give them affection and they just push them away. Person wants to talk, they don't want to talk. Why? They're testing. Is they going to keep pursuing me? Are they going to give up easily or are they going to keep trying to get to me or they might question them and go you know you don't really love me do you and they might put that question many many different ways but but they're just constantly challenging you don't really love me or they may go around you know what I'm such a loser I don't know why you have me what why you want a relationship with me you're probably getting tired of me you're probably going to start to think about finding somebody else because I'm just, I have nothing to offer. Or they might even suggest someone, have you noticed that person over there? Wow, I just really am impressed with them. They're so nice, they're so outgoing, and you're just testing to see what their response is going to be to that person. 
testing, testing, testing. Are they going to abandon me? But do you realize how tiring that gets in a relationship? And all the time is you're not receiving any love from them. You're keeping them at arm's length. And that takes to the next one. People with huge abandonment issues basically say, I can't let anybody connect in a healthy way with me and truly get to know me intimately. I need to maintain walls. I need to wear masks, adopt roles. That's the only way they're going to want to stay with me is with a fake intimacy, a superficial intimacy. And so what they do is keep walls in place. So a person trying to get to know them, they keep bumping into a wall. They only get to know them so far, and then they can't get to know the real them. And what do you do? You end up driving people away. Or some go to creating unrealistic expectations for the relationship. So what they basically say is, if you love me, and you're not going to abandon me, then you will only love me. You won't love anybody else. If you love anybody else, that's a sign you're going to abandon me. And so they then try to control all the other relationships so you have no other friendships. I'm the only person in your life. That's my way of securing that you're not going to abandon me. We see how... That's abusive. That's not going to work. Second thing some people do as far as expectations is, the only way I can be sure you're not going to abandon me is that you never have a flaw, you never fail me, you never let me down, you basically are perfect. The moment I find a flaw, and you can be sure I'm going to be looking for a flaw, the moment I find a flaw, well, we're done. Well, nobody can live up to that. Or another one is you must give me constant validation. You must tell me many times every day, fuss over me, how you love me, how wonderful I am, on and on. If you don't, then that tells me you must find me unlovable and you're planning to leave me. Or you must never set boundaries with me. You must never say no to me. You must never require your own space. You must never confront me. You must let me do whatever I want. That's the only way I can be convinced you're not going to abandon me. That's really unhealthy. You must give me constant attention. If you want to do something on your own one night, well, basically that tells me you're losing interest in me and you're going to abandon me. So you must have no personal space. And then you must never criticize me, give me constructive criticism, give me advice, because that's saying I'm wrong, I'm stupid, that's saying you look down on me, that's saying you reject me, and so you're going to abandon me. So you must never say anything negative to me. So all of those, for many people, come out of that fear of abandonment. And it is just huge. And I hope if you can see that in yourself, you realize that the healing that fear is healing the deep wound of abandonment and the shame that goes with it. Okay, next fear that comes out of complex trauma, fear of angry people. Many people grew up with anger, were abused because of anger. They just hate conflict. They just give in to make peace at any price because they're afraid of angry people. And then, like we said, you create what you fear. And we looked at it with abandonment. Let me give you just one more example. A lot of people who are never val validated as a child, they long for validation. Their fear is that they're not going to get validation. 
but what they end up doing is creating what they fear. So they long for validation. That's what they want so much. They fear never being validated. So what do they do? They try to be the center of attention all the time. They ask people constantly, did I do good, did I do good, did I do good? And after a while, people just go, whoa, this person is way too needy. And they just stop giving them validation. So the person created the very thing they feared, the thing they were trying to avoid. And that's the sad thing that comes out of complex trauma. Okay, very quickly, I want to give you a whole bunch of other fears that many people have that come out of complex trauma. And so what, we're, what you're going to see is we're going to end up looking at over 50 different fears today that come out of complex trauma. So fear of being alone, always needing people around me. Fear of dying alone. Fear of not fitting in or not belonging is a huge one. Fear of being different, a weirdo. Fear that no one will ever get me so huge. Fear of being misunderstood. Fear of losing your identity. Fear of embarrassment in public. Fear of looking stupid when people are watching you. Fears regarding your mental health that you might end up with depression, that you might end up with major mental health issues. Fears regarding your physical health of getting some sickness, fears regarding your finances, fears regarding your children who are in addiction right now, fears that your young children might follow the same path as you did that might not be a good path, fear of losing children, fear of, and that could be to child and family services, Fear of not getting your children back if you lose them. Fear that your children won't forgive you for the stuff that you did to them. Fears that your children won't want to be, be in a relationship with you when they get older. Many have a fear of aging, a, a fear of dying, a fear of gaining weight, Fear of a body that's no longer attractive. Many have a fear that I got to go back to my past and deal with all these old wounds. Oh, that's just too scary. I got to deal with these losses. Oh, that's too scary. And so there's huge fear there. Some fear, okay, I'm going to go back and deal with all that stuff, but I'm afraid all that hard work's not going to pay off. Others, okay, I'm going to do hard work, but maybe I'm not going to get totally fixed. This recovery thing, there's not going to be a magic fix. It's going to be work for the rest of my life. I'm afraid of that ongoing work for the rest of my life. People that come out of addiction, alcoholism, often are, have a deep fear that they won't be able to drink socially, which was a part of their culture. Fear of getting healthy. I'm going to be a different person. Am I going to like that person? I won't be able to be an irresponsible child in an adult body. So I'm afraid of growing up and getting healthy. Many coming out of complex trauma have a fear that they're never going to achieve their dreams and their goals. Or... Many who come out of complex trauma, they developed ways of surviving. That could be lying, stealing, flirting, using their body. And they're afraid to give up that main coping tool, that main survival tool, that old behavior. Fear of becoming responsible, fear that they'll get in a relationship and their partner's going to cheat on them or find somebody else. Fear that 
It's your fault that your partner's depressed or angry. Fear that you're never going to find your purpose in life. Fear that you're losing control. Fear of becoming authentic. That's going to result in rejection. Fear of being vulnerable. Fear of never being good enough. An interesting one for many people coming out of complex trauma is a fear of being boring or a fear of disappointing people and letting them down. Some with anxiety, they have a fear that their anxiety might get triggered and they could become anxious. Then there's specific phobias that many have, spiders, snakes, flying, elevators, etc. Some have a fear of their own emotions, of feeling emotions. Some have a fear of just specific emotions like anger or sadness, or they have a fear of certain thoughts that come into their head. Some have a fear of moving out of their comfort zone. Some have a deep fear that they're going to end up becoming like their parents. The very thing that hurt them, the very thing that they hated. So those are a whole bunch of fears. How many of those were true of you? Again, hopefully what I want people to realize is you can't understand complex trauma till you see the centrality of fear in a person's adult life. And most have stuffed it down so much, denied it, that they're totally unaware of it. But that doesn't mean it's not operating at a subconscious level. And when it gets triggered, it can do a ton of damage. And so the more we're able to become aware of our fear and how it's affecting us, the more we're able to deal with this. Now let's come to... How do we begin to deal with this? Well, you have to begin to understand your fear symptoms. What are the things that I can look for to show me that fear is building? So what happens for a lot of people is they're not aware of fear until it hits 10 out of 10. What we want is to become aware of when fear is building and it's at a three or a four or a five. So we see the early symptoms, the early warning signs that fear is building and we can stop it and deal with it before it hits a 10 out of 10 and then we explode. So there's physical symptoms that you can look out for, trembling, feeling a bit twitchy, sweating, muscle tension, muscle aches, clenched teeth, clenched jaw, teeth grinding, shooting pains, stabbing pains, feeling pressure in your neck, your head, your face. Some get nauseous. Some get diarrhea, irritable bowel syndrome. Some get headaches, dizziness, lightheaded. They feel like they're floating. All of those can be physical fear symptoms. Then fear will affect your thinking. So some people will begin to know their thinking becomes obsessive about small things. And it becomes what some call brain chatter. It's just their brains like hamster on a wheel. It just spins, spins, spins. And they start to blow stuff out of proportion. They can't let go of, of worrying about things. And then they can even start worrying that they're worrying too much. They jump to the worst case scenario in their thinking. Others start becoming very negative and critical about everything. Some turn it inward and start getting down on themselves about everything. Others get hypervigilant and they just start noticing and they're very on guard. So notice how it affects your thinking. Then it'll affect other emotions, not just fear, anxiety, but a lot will realize that their anger is increasing as their anxiety increases. They get more irritable, 
They're less patient and tolerant with people. Their expectations of others go up. You should meet all my needs now. You should do this for me now. That happens. They're very irritable, grouchy. Anything sets them off. And then if something triggers them, nanosecond, they go into exploding. So anger, look for that. Then some, they start getting depressed. Life sucks, it's so hard, and they just go to a dark place. Others, as anxiety builds, they just start to feel stressed out and overwhelmed. And so that can lead to, for some, what's called emotional flipping roller coaster dramatic mood swings they feel great they feel terrible life is wonderful i'm top of it life sucks i can't do anything some one of their warning signs is all of a sudden they cry for no apparent reason even watching a commercial on tv they're get urged to cry where's that coming from usually because stuff's building inside of you Others, as anxiety builds, they start to lose some of their normal emotions that they have when they're doing well. So their empathy for others, their warmth to others, their enjoyment of certain things, that all goes away. So be aware of that. Now let me come to healing. And what I want you to understand up front is sadly some people just think you should be able to find an instant fix to anxiety to just make it go away just do this and it'll be gone that doesn't understand complex trauma where it's been building for years it's in the subconscious for years it is part of your autopilot your default setting you don't just make that disappear It takes a lot of work and a lot of years to become aware of it and to heal and to grow and to get good tools. So don't look for a quick fix. But here's kind of what is important in beginning to deal with anxiety if you realize, man, I've got anxiety as the core of who I am. What happens with anxiety is the moment you start to feel it, your brain wants to go to fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. So you have to begin to learn to tolerate anxiety without running. And so you've got to learn to sit in distress a little bit. So anxiety triggers your limbic brain. Your limbic brain wants to go fight, flight, freeze, fawn. What you're doing now is, okay, I don't have to run out of my limbic brain. I can tolerate being my limbic brain, but i got to get back to my cortex. So that's the process. But you have to learn to sit in some discomfort and that will gradually grow so that you can handle more and more discomfort. But that's where it begins. And that is hard. Now we're going to basically end up with two main coping things and it's called mindfulness and grounding. And it comes out of DBT or Dialectical Behavior Therapy And it's really managing my limbic brain when it's triggered, getting back to my cortex. What are tools that help me do that? And so if anxiety is the main emotion that gets triggered all the time, then I can use DBT to help me learn to manage anxiety. So grounding is basically de-escalating my limbic brain. Getting out of that so that I can get back to my cortex where I can think again and process the situation. I'm not just in limbic brain survival mode. Mindfulness is saying when I'm not in crisis mode, I need to be coming more aware of how much anxiety do I have right now. I need to be what is underneath that anxiety. What is causing me to have anxiety? So there's awareness of my anxiety level, awareness of what's underneath my anxiety, and then developing 
tools and activities that help me grow and become more mature so that I can handle anxiety better. So that's the big picture of what you're working on. Now let me give you some other practical things that I hope will help you. Many people, their anxiety gets triggered when they have a plan to go out and do something that's social, that's new, that's going to stretch them a little bit. They have anxiety. Face that with a plan, a very little steps plan. So I'm going to a social event. I'm going to feel anxiety, okay? I'm not real strong at this yet, so maybe what I can do is go to this social event, but I'll sit near a door. And if I get a little overwhelmed, I can step outside for a bit and come back in. But I got a little plan in place so that I can handle it. That's the kind of thing I'm talking about. So you want to do that over and over again in every area. And often you'll need somebody who knows you well, who understands anxiety well, who can help you think through a plan for what you're going to be facing. The next thing, remember that when your anxiety is triggered, it affects your thinking because your limbic brain goes to distorted limbic brain thinking. So part of what you're doing is getting back to your cortex and reminding yourself of the truth. When you're in your limbic brain, limbic brain doesn't keep track of time. Only your cortex does. So your limbic brain, you feel like the age that wound happened. So you might feel five, six, or seven, or eight. And you're going to think like a five, six, seven, or eight-year-old. And you're going to feel, I'm all alone. Nobody's supporting me. I don't have the tools to handle this. So I might as well fight, flight, or freeze. So what you're going to do now is get back to your cortex and go, no, it feels like I'm alone, but that's not true. I now have people in my life that love me and support me. It feels like I don't have tools, but that's not true. I've been learning tools. I have tools I can now use. And so you replace the lies, the distortions, with the truth. But please be kind to yourself. You're going to struggle This is not going to get conquered easily. Don't beat yourself up if you give in to anxiety a little bit. It is so deeply ingrained, it's not going to get uprooted overnight and change. Be gracious to yourself. Beating yourself up is only going to make the anxiety worse. Compassion, self-compassion is so important. Another thing that's helpful for many people is bring your fears out of the darkness into the light and talk to somebody about them. That, just in doing that, can free up some of that fear for many people. And then begin to know your triggers. What triggers your anxiety? So it could be a reminder of past events, It could be any situation where you don't feel in control, where you feel stress, where you feel overwhelmed. So be aware of that. It could be any time you go through a change or a disruption of a normal routine. That could trigger anxiety. Any time where you feel vulnerable, that will probably trigger anxiety. Any time where there's conflict in a relationship or you feel attacked or criticized, that will trigger anxiety. Anytime there's separation or loss, anytime you're lonely, that's going to trigger the abandonment, the anxiety. Let me give you this. A lot of people, when they get triggered, they get mad at themselves. They feel like they failed because they've been triggered. Look at a trigger this way. A trigger is actually a friend. It is there to help you. A trigger is an old wound that never healed. So little you that was wounded and that was never nurtured and healed and resolved. Way back when, today that's getting touched. That wound's getting touched. And what a trigger is, is that little you wound going, ouch. 
So instead of getting mad at that wound, say, oh, thank you, Trigger, for pointing out to me a wound that I haven't healed yet and pointing me to where I need to go next in my healing journey. That can be very, very helpful for people. Okay, know those early warning signs so that when you see those early warning signs that you're at a three, four, five, you're able to say, oh, oh what's going on here? Be mindful. Uh, anxiety's building. So what's the cause of that? Okay, what do I need to change to deal with that so I can resolve it now and not wait till it hits a 10? So the better you know your early warning signs, the earlier you're able to identify anxiety is building, deal with it, and resolve it. That is so important. And so do two, three times a day uh, an emotional inventory where you go, scale of 1 to 10, where's my anxiety at? And it's going to take you a while to get good at that, but... It's so important to just stop, get yourself quiet, and go, what do I feel in my body? Where's my anxiety at? And pay attention. And then you go, whoa, I got a bunch of anxiety here. I wasn't even aware of because I'm so busy. Oh, I, I, it's worse than I thought. What am I going to do about this? So that's an important thing. And then, like we said, prepare in advance for situations that you know will produce anxiety so you have a plan. And then it boils down to in every situation where you have anxiety, to ask yourself, what can I con control in resolving this and what can't I control? So let me just focus on what I can control and then I'm going to have to learn to trust in the areas I can't control. That is a very difficult but important step. So that's fear, anxiety. I hope this is informative for you. I hope it's helpful.